The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Uh, great to have you with us and great to have my co-hosts here, Phil Ordway and Elliot Turner. It's been a while. Uh, it's great to be back. We have a terrific uh, episode for you today. Uh, so let's launch right into it. Over to you, Elliot. Great. Thanks, John. And uh, thank you all for being so patient this summer. It was great to hear how many of you missed us. So really appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. And, you know, it's hard to notice the absence of something. So that says a lot to me that uh, the lack of uh, recording was was noticed. Uh, you know, it was a good summer and it's equally good to be back now. And fittingly, I think, you know, the very last podcast we did before we took our break was on the lagging small caps against large caps. And we're going to revisit that topic today because it's a good way to kind of come full circle, talk a little bit about what's happened, add a few new wrinkles, and then we'll obviously get into some newer topics uh, over the coming uh, weeks. But, you know, what was interesting was I heard so much feedback from you all about both sides of the case, that there is something structural and smalls will continue to lag versus bigs. And some people were telling me, you know, it's going to get worse for smalls before it gets better and giving me pretty uh, strong reasons as to why. And there are other people who are like, yeah, you know, it's obvious to me that small caps are the place to be right now and we should all go forward. So I think it's also interesting that as we sit here today, Apple is now bigger than the entire small cap space. So that's really telling, I think, in its own right. It makes sense that the biggest companies keep getting bigger as time goes on, but the whole small cap space I'd referenced this stat before, but it's gotten more pronounced. It's uh, less than 4% of the aggregate market cap in the US. And it's basically, um, you know, that that hasn't happened other than during the 1930s. So we're not in a Great Depression, but that was the last time and only time that's persisted uh, insofar as we have data. And, you know, the S&P 600 today, as it stands, is at trough valuations. Trough meaning, like, this is as low as it's been in the post-World War II sample size. It's, well, I'm sorry, in, in the post, um, is since since the 1980s, um, it's at where it was at the very depths of the great financial crisis. Um, and so that's, that's according to Yardeni's information. And the large caps, you know, they're not in even a low level. They're kind of in the upper third of their reaches in valuation terms in this epic. And then you can break it down by sector. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that healthcare and real estate are at peak PEs within the S&P 600. And a lot of that has to do with a really uh, depressed E rather than anything specific happening on the price side. In fact, those are two of the more beaten down sectors more recently. While financials, materials, and consumer discretionary are all like scraping along and forging new lows. Um, everything I didn't mention is either in the midpoint or bottom third of their valuation range. And I think it's especially interesting that consumer discretionary is sitting there with financials and, and materials. Um, so I point that out because that one of the biggest arguments I'd gotten against uh, small caps is this notion that there are increasing returns to scale, that the winners keep winning, the big gets bigger. And I think in consumer discretionary, those dynamics don't exactly play out. And I think the intra-sector spreads between large and small can't really be entirely explained by the scale factors because it happens in sectors where you wouldn't necessarily think 
scaling is that beneficial, relatively speaking. Though the great Twitter account, No Sunk Cost, has pointed out that Brian Arthur from Santa Fe Institute, Institute, he wrote this fascinating paper in the Harvard Business Review in 1996 called Increasing Returns in the New World of Business. And Arthur makes the argument that you know, here's here's a quote that kind of like tees up the, the rest of the paper, but if a product or a company or a technology, one of many competing in a market, gets ahead by chance or clever strategy, increasing returns can magnify this advantage and the product or company or technology can go on to lock in the market. More than causing products to become standards, increasing returns cause businesses to work differently and they stand many of our notions of how business operate on their head. And key also was this notion that the rest of the economy will suffer diminishing returns. And I'd say, well, that's a compelling argument. It doesn't exactly fly with some of the increased turnover in amongst the biggest companies when companies tend to get big. Um, you know, they haven't lasted that way for a long time, although this epic, I guess, looks a little different in that sense. Previously, that was the case. Uh, but also, you know, there's kind of... Um, a shorter duration of the average company in the S&P 500. So that hasn't exactly, uh, I, there, there's some parts of it that aren't totally explained. And then one other data point, you know, that kind of gets past Arthur, and I'll ask you guys to talk about uh, that paper and, and that notion, whether it's real or whether, whether it explains this phenomenon or not. But uh, Jeff Weninger, uh, he shared a chart showing how there's only one rolling 20 year period where small caps lagged large by this substantial a margin. And that was at basically the peak of the dot-com bubble in 1999. So smalls have actually like had this general trend of lagging large a little bit over that uh, time period, despite Fama and French pointing to smalls as one of the, uh, you know, higher returning areas of the market. Uh, but it, it, it actually has had this general trend of small lagging large, but there's a really pronounced, and this is the most pronounced uh, epic of underperformance. Um, so one of the things that I that I point to that I think really explains this is that passive uh, allocations to passive um, are a very big part of what's going on here. Um, that the active space has been decimated. Even within active, you have this effect where really large funds have been raising money and small funds have been kind of perishing one by one. So even if some raise money, others are leaving the space. And so the big within the management, the, the active management space are getting bigger and that makes it harder to play in small. And passive flows, when someone buys a 2040 fund, they're going to get a lot of S&P. They are not going to get any small cap. You know, they're going to get uh, their, their blend of uh, bonds. They're not going to get small cap. And that kind of keeps as passive gets flows, accelerating the flows out of small caps and into large caps. And I think one of the more startling stats that Mario Sabelli had put out to me, I didn't realize how extreme it was, but we've now had 15 consecutive years of outflows from small caps. And that tells me alone that it's not something economic, that it's structural, that's pulling ownership out of small caps and putting this weight on the space. So with that, I want to ask you all, you know, is active versus passive the cause here? What do you think of the active versus passive debate generally? Um, smalls versus large, you know, uh, what do you think about Brian Arthur? Do, do the big just keep getting bigger and winning? And also, what do you think from a portfolio manager, manager perspective? You know, we're all value investors. We like looking where there's pain. That's big part of why this conversation intrigues me so much. Do you start getting even more aggressive in small caps today? Like leave aside your bigs, even if you really like them and just focus on making smalls a much bigger piece. Yeah. So I guess I would start by saying it's good to be back as well. It's good to talk with you guys again. It's been quite a while. It was a good summer, but uh, glad to be here. And as for this, I, I'm curious. I mean, the one thing that really stood out to me there used to be some of the earlier things that I've thought about and and we've discussed was the data point you just mentioned 15 consecutive years of outflows from small caps do you know what you the heard that right was, or how how was that measured that was in what sense were their outflows from from small cap actively managed funds or what was that it's an aggregate of passive and active so it measures everything the only thing I, it, it it captures the mutual fund world it does not capture the hedge fund world Okay. And it captures ETFs as well. 
Well, that's interesting that if it captures ETFs, because that was going to be one of my guesses. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm with you that I think there's a component here that's structural, clearly, because this is just a different world than we ever used to have with the massive amount of money that's dedicated to to passive strategies. Uh, and we've had that discussion before, and I think it's largely a good thing, but there are some knock on consequences that are at least more mixed and and this might be one of them i think you know the one thing that i keep coming back to as well is that i there was an interesting conversation and rant by jamie diamond earlier this week at the barclays conference where he sort of pointed to the over regulation of banks was was more or less his argument that it would, regulators had gone a bit too far and he tied that into the declining number of publicly traded companies you know the number of private equity backed companies has exploded in, in coincidence it's been you know there's been a sharp decline in the number of publicly traded companies now again the peak of the number of publicly traded companies was right at the peak of the dot com bubble and if you look a little more normalized you know it, it, there's nothing to say that there weren't just too many publicly traded companies back then and maybe we've been working off that excess ever since i mean likewise you know when i was born there were 7 or 8000 banks and we've cut that number by about half. So was is that because we've overregulated the banks, or is that just because we started with too many banks? And uh, I'm probably a little bit more in the camp that there were just too many banks and possibly less certain, but possibly too many public companies at, at the peak of the dot com bubble. So anyway, I I don't know. I, I mean, the short answer is I, I find this fascinating. I agree that you would think, given the very clear you know, logic that that these mega cap superstar companies, as good as they are, and they've never been better, you know, trees can't grow to the sky. You would think there would be a day in the sun for the next generation of companies, the smaller companies, to make up some of this performance that they've, you know, clearly been on the wrong side of for many, many years now. But I guess the one thing I keep coming back to is I just wouldn't want to have to make a firm prediction here, right? If you said you could only own one of the S and P or the Russell 2000. I don't know which one I'd pick because this could go on for however many more years. I mean, this is probably, I mean, this is an important debate. Don't get me wrong, but you know, in, in terms of the crazy, like mind bending and particularly some of the stupid stuff. I mean, here we are in 2023 and we're still talking about meme stocks. So <laughs> this is still like, you know, one of the least crazy things going on in the world today. And it could continue for years. I I have no idea how much longer this this could continue. Yeah, I no one can say how long it'll continue. I, I do think it's a very stark uh kind of moment in time and discrepancy between small and large. And you know, my hunch would be that small uh, will outperform um going forward and i think we've had um you know kind of large versus small at extremes um but they have been also been extremes in the market um i don't know that we've gone much beyond where we are today um you know to me there's just also a very strong argument to be made for small cap in terms of um, the ability to incentivize the senior management and the employees, um, you just can align things better at a smaller company. The payoffs can be can be uh, just just better aligned than at an Apple. You know, how's an which employees of Apple are truly aligned with the shareholders? You know, so. Um, and and there's companies being founded all the time. Um, I think creative destruction is alive and well. And you know, with things like AI, um, I mean, how quickly did Chat Chat GPT emerge as a potential competitor to Google? So, you know, something like Apple might seem um, untouchable right now, but you know that doesn't have to be true especially if you go forward a few years yeah i i i think that's a huge part of it john is like i that that's i guess if you really made me bet i would bet on the small caps given a a slight tendency towards 
not reversion to the means the wrong thing, but is, is the wrong concept in a strict sense. But in general, something that's been underwhelming for this long would would attract my attention a little bit more than something that's been just shining and outperforming. Right. I mean, there, there's a reason why Ben Graham put all that have fallen will be restored and vice versa at the beginning of of uh, security analysis. Right. And I think that a principle does in general still apply here. And that's why I find, you know, some of the debates we get into right now about regulation and antitrust in particular to be so amusing that, you know, there, there's just one monopoly after another stifling competition. And I, I couldn't see it any more differently. I think there's lots and lots of creative destruction right now. And the economy is quite healthy in that regard. And it might never be easier to get a company up and running in one sense. And it might never be easier or it might never be harder to maintain that position than it's ever been. Right. I mean, it is very easy for somebody to come along and eat your lunch. I mean, it feels like just yesterday we were talking about, you know, how Twitter had built you know, the greatest platform, you know, for communication that the world had seen in recent times. And, you know, it didn't take the world's richest man and, and a very successful entrepreneur in his own right to destroy it in a matter of months, right? And and that had been building for a while, but, and, you know, Facebook and Meta has seen a version of that. It, John, you just pointed out Google, which has been as good a company as you could ever hope to have, you know, maybe they face problems down the road. And so, again, you start looking at some of these companies, uh, Apple's another good one where, you know, yeah, it's, it's got a higher market cap than the entire Russell 2000. I, it's really hard to capitalize those earnings out in year 10 or 20, right? I mean, I wouldn't bet against it, but yeah, it gets difficult when you talk about a trillion or 2 trillion of earnings that you have to capitalize across the entire Russell 2000 or a company like Amazon or Apple or Microsoft or whatever. It's a, it's a tricky debate and, uh, I would not want to go, I certainly wouldn't want to go all in on one company like that versus owning the Russell 2000 or something similar. Yeah, you said it a lot better than me. What I was trying to say about like this notion of creative destruction, uh, where companies can go from like, you know, great success to uh, imminent demise so much quicker. That would be a point in the face against Brian Arthur's point of increasing returns to scale and winners winning more, uh, where it's kind of maybe they get to enjoy increasing returns for some period of time, but that period of time is far shorter than, you know, what Mobson calls a competitive advantage period uh, for a firm in a prior uh, epoch of time. And I think the Apple example is an interesting one. I think it's also interesting to compare Apple with Google, right? I mean, even if you just look at what the consensus estimates are for the next three years, Google is supposed to grow at double the rate of Apple over that time. And yet, Apple trades at nine turns higher in EV to EBITDA multiple. So like 21 uh, instead of Google's 12. What explains that? I don't really know. And, you know, I guess some people might say Google's uh, facing antitrust scrutiny to a greater degree than Apple, though that's you know not entirely true on the week that Apple launches a new phone with USB-C because of some emergent antitrust uh, concerns out of Europe. Um, you might say that Apple's got a greater degree of ecosystem lock-in and Google's facing greater th- threats from AI. But meanwhile, Apple doesn't really have an AI offering and Google's got pretty phenomenal AI, so it may be as big an opportunity as it is a risk there. Um, not arguing the merits of one versus the other, but I'm just going to say that maybe flows explain this a little more than other things. Um, and maybe that's a bit to do with why um, why you're seeing what's happening in small caps, right? 15 years of, of outflows is just mind boggling. Like that can't be fundamental forces where everyone's like, oh, this year small caps are a little worse off than last, so I'm going to sell them. And this year and rinse, wash, repeat. No, I agree. That can't be all fundamentals. Um, it, it, and it's also not like, you know, you're coming out of a period of mid to late 1980s in Japan where the valuations were just so insane, it was going to take you 15 or 25 or 30 years to work it off. So, um, you know, even if you believe that 15 years ago, small caps were relatively expensive, which I'm not arguing that either way, but uh, I don't think that's the whole story here either. I uh, There's clearly a combination of massive amounts of 
uneconomic allocation toward the S and P 500 at the expense of smaller caps and and some combination of the narrative taking hold that bigger is better. And you know, again, I mean, we've, we've talked about this a little bit on prior episodes, but there there is some correlation if you were to step back and look at the broader economy or the broader society. I mean, you know. CEO pay relative to C- CEOs at large companies relative to CEOs at small companies, CEOs relative to number two, you know, people in a company, you know, superstar musicians and athletes relative to smaller acts. I mean, that that gap has widened even more dramatically than what we're talking about. And so that's where I think some of the stuff you alluded to earlier, Elliot, you know, you can you can really get an academic going by starting to draw these kind of cross referenced analogies to other parts of the economy, other parts of the world. And uh, I'm not smart enough to say that I have any opinion as to whether or not there's validity there, but I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah, to that point, I mean, on artists, right? This was the summer of Taylor Swift. So, you know, I think what you're talking about are power laws and the distribution. And as things grow, like as our economy has grown a lot over the last, uh, you know, 50 years, power laws would explain a lot of why the big are bigger than they had been, but I'm not sure they explain a lot about uh, the relative pull that is happening. Like there should be some sort of constant scaling factor between small and big, or or at least some degree of consistency um, in in the the nature uh, and the relationship between them, right? Globalization maybe explains part of it. The bigs are definitely more exposed to global. So they're not as tethered to the economy. They're not as cyclical, Um, but something definitely feels off. And I feel like consumer discretionary is part of the area where it feels especially off because those kinds of companies, you know, I, I, what I don't know are the relative ROICs of a large cap consumer discretionary versus small, but like, why would that be, so pronounced and so like worse off today than during the GFC. I would think it's it's almost the contrary. It could be something to do with the degree of leverage in some of the small cap companies in the space now that interest rates are the concern, uh, less so than you know what what the state of the economy is. Um, but yeah, it just seems anomalous. Yeah, I don't know if there's a difference. I doubt it. I mean, I'll try to look this up. I, uh, it would probably take a little bit of effort, but if you were to calculate a reliable return on invested capital amongst large caps or even a handful of large caps and compare it to the Russell 2000. I I doubt that explains too much of the story. I think it would be either in fact or in narrative, some attribution of returns to scale or, uh, in my opinion, some misapplication of growth right if if you're talking about these types of prices and multiples and valuations you have to believe there's future growth right i mean because so much of the s&p 500 it's not crazy it's not unprecedented but a lot of it is is been driven in in recent times by the biggest companies and those big companies can't by definition be worth a trillion 2 trillion each without a lot of future growth right and that's where the math gets a little tricky because you know, you start talking about that level of growth and you get into the absurd math that often gets people in trouble. Like, well, if they, if you sell two iPhones to every person in China kind of stuff, it just gets ridiculous in a hurry. And that's where, again, you would think given that I believe we'd all agree that, you know, creative destruction is alive and well, you'd think the Russell 2000 and small caps would have more room to grow and to keep turning over that next cycle of innovation and that next leg of growth vis-a-vis these monster mega cap companies that are already so big that by definition, they're going to be more constrained in their future growth. And then, you know, to that same point, I think at some point uh, on the math, the earnings power and cash flow at small caps have to outweigh even the better return profile of the larger companies. Yeah, I would just... um... You know, go back to the example of of Taylor Swift. I'm not even sure that uh, kind of an argument in favor of the of the large caps because, you know, if you think about Taylor Swift, um, she's the one capturing the bulk of those economics, and uh, you could kind of view her as a, as the ultimate creator, if you will. Um, and and that's where you know again we come to incentive alignment, right? Um, 
today, the top creators are actually able to capture most of their economics, which may be in the past, um, you know, an Apple uh, would have actually captured most of it. And they capture quite a bit, of course. But, you know, Taylor Swift is getting uh, most of that value that she's creating. And so, um, you know, I feel like um, that that kind of raises the question of equities as an asset class. You know, are they basically going to lose share to um, employees? And by employees, I'm really talking about the top creators, which personally can capture so much of the value they create. They don't need to cede so much value to equities as an asset class to corporations because that distribution channel is no longer needed or they can go direct uh, much more easily. So, you know, if, if you think about the top artists, the top musicians, the top um, sports people capturing more and more of those economics, that's not necessarily an argument in favor of the equity value of the biggest corporations. Right. And that's, you know, to stretch the analogy, John, that's exactly kind of what I was getting at earlier. Like is if you were, even if you didn't know in advance that the Taylor Swift tour this summer was going to blow the doors off of everything imaginable, but you had a good hunch that there was lots and lots of demand and you could invest in just that and all the upside that would come from it or a collection of, you know, of similarly sized in aggregate, quote unquote, small cap, singers and musicians, you know, which one would you do? And I think it's an interesting proposition, right? I think the the popular narrative has been that, no, no, you go all in on your superstars, right? And I mean, since we're starting football and NFL season, I mean, that's clearly been the case, right? I mean, you, you, you go all in on the superstar quarterback, you know, at the expense of, say, the running back, because that's just been the way the game has evolved lately, is you have to have the one superstar running back and you go to a smaller stable of relatively inexpensive running backs that you rotate through. And I think that narrative has per, has been pervasive in lots of different parts of society, partly for good reason. But again, one of my golden rules of life is that everything that gets you in trouble in this realm is a good idea that's just taken too far. And I, I don't know if we've gone too far yet in terms of over-extrapolating the investment virtues of these mega cap superstars, but it's certainly worth a discussion at this point. I mean, we could very well be kind of right around that point now. Yeah, I think those are great points all around. And I think it ties into some of the big debates of the day in the market, specifically, right, stock comp. Why is there so much stock comp nowadays? Well, you know, superstar employees want to get paid a lot. And then other ones like founder control and companies that have gone public, like a lot of these great companies, Google being one of the example, have multiple share classes where the founders have locked down control um, effectively in perpetuity um, because they were founders. They needed very little outside capital. They were able to hold on to the majority of what they had. And you know those advantages lead to a class of people. I mean, Zuckerberg uh, himself, you know, extreme amount of wealth tied to, uh, you know, we thought it was really impressive when Bill Gates uh, back in the day, but guys like Zuckerberg, Musk, um, it's just way more concentration at the top. And I think it's interesting to think about the Taylor Swift analogy as well, because one of the things that she was able to do is when her earlier rights, when she was effectively a small cap uh, artist, Um, she had to record and others owned the rights to her music and they ended up in the hands of someone she didn't like. So she decided she's just going to re-record all of those songs with Taylor's version and kind of destroy the entire value of those original recordings. Um, And it makes me feel maybe a little similarly to the small cap I had this summer taken out by management at what I think was a really, really, really bad price because they'd already owned a lot and didn't need a lot of outside capital to buy the rest. Yeah, I, that's interesting too. I I didn't address this earlier, but uh, to that point, you asked earlier, you know, is now the time to lean in 
on small caps at the expense of large caps that you might like? And I guess my answer to that would be pretty definitively no, just because that's not how I invest. And I think you just have to take that into consideration as to what are you trying to do? How are you trying to invest? If I were limited, like I said, to really broad asset allocation kind of decisions and my the tools at my disposal were really just tweaking the weighting in a portfolio between large caps and small caps, then yeah, I would be open in that world, particularly if I thought I was overweighted in large caps to to moving that towards more a more neutral weighting or even going the other way into slightly overweighted uh, into small caps to a certain extent. Uh, but in this case, like, you know, again, I think most people are going to be familiar with this. Like, I, That's not how I invest. I invest in a discrete portfolio of individual investments where I'm evaluating the companies on their own economic merits and and pretending like it was a, a standalone investment of the entire company where I trust management to act in my own best interest as an outside minority shareholder. And so on that basis, no, I wouldn't make any judgments or even any tiebreaker kind of decisions on market cap alone. I mean, again, I part and parcel to that would be like a very detailed thought around, okay, how big is this company and how much can it really go? Can it really grow? Um, so, you know, I don't own Microsoft directly to use that as an example, but I would think long and hard about, okay, how much could this grow over the next three, five, 10 years? And that makes a massive impact on what I think it's worth today. Um, you know, at the other end of the table, I mean, I've only made one new investment this year and that's not unusual. That's a pretty typical pace for me. And it just so happened that it was a pretty small little company as a billion, five, $2 billion market cap. So, um, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm I'm neutral in that regard. I would say, you know, as active investors, what what's the choice we're really facing? It's not do we buy Apple or all of the small caps, right? Because we can actually be picky about which small companies you buy. So the choice is, you know, if you take let, let's say the handful of mega caps or a dozen, however many there are that are, you know, truly huge market caps. Um, none of them are very cheap. You know, you could argue they're not super expensive, a few of them, but basically they have seen, you know, part of the reason why they take up so much share of the overall uh, equity market cap is that they have seen margin expansion or, or multiple expansion. It hasn't been just that their profit growth has outpaced the profit growth of small caps. So, you know, they are generally fairly priced at least. And then as active investors, you know, can you among the thousands of small caps find 10 or 20, however many investments you want to have in your portfolio that are much more, uh, you know, inefficiently priced than those mega caps and you know if an active investor can't answer yes to that um and and you know maybe you throw in uh one mega cap uh, if you think it's it's exceptional but if you can't find some true um discrepancies in the small cap space you know you maybe you should uh reevaluate <laughs> Yeah, and I think even even among those of us that have the the situation you just 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 described, John, which I certainly do on a day to day basis, other things like uh, certain retirement plans or college five twenty nine style plans, a lot of times there you are kind of limited, uh, at least in some respects, to broader decisions where you're you're limited to ETFs or you're limited to asset allocation type decisions. So that, that's a good way of thinking of it too. I mean, we we do all kind of face this decision in one way, shape, or form. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to think about, you know, one of the responses I'd heard from a lot of people is like, well, you're trying to say that there's no like um, there, there's no outperformance to be had by buying the large cap companies. Uh, and that's that's a line a lot of people have flouted. And there's been a lot of debate about whether like, oh, look, you know, there's been plenty of alpha to be had in, in some of these very large companies, plenty of outperformance that you could find just by focusing on some of these very best. And that um has kind of been the case for a decade since they've become the biggest of the big 
But at the same time, you know, I think part of the small cap problem is they are way more volatile than the typical large cap. Like some of the small caps that I've been buying, there are a few where the average move is like 8% on a given day, which is like closer to the monthly volatility of some of these large caps. So it comes down to portfolio construction also. If you end up with a handful of small caps, all of whom are subject to the very same factor forces, you know, you could have some really wild swings uh, on a given day. And I know that's not necessarily risk, but it could change how you and your clients act to it. So there are ways you could approach small uh, cap portfolio construction to maybe dampen, uh, you know, pursuing some degree of diversification across sectors, different kinds of setups, and even, you know, incorporating some of the very bigs. I've got two of the mega caps. And, you know, to be honest, one of my debates is should I should I leave it or to the to the big seven. One of my debates is should I kind of say goodbye for now and and pursue some of the opportunities in smalls or should I just have them as as a piece to kind of, you know, if I'm wrong that small caps actually work, you know, these are the two that I feel like really comfortable with, have owned for a long time and, you know, so be it on that front. Uh it's something I'm very actively debating nowadays. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think, you know, many investors you don't have the luxury of uh managing a, a a fund the way you might manage a personal account um and that's part of the reason why i think we are where we are i mean it's the whole passive versus active right the ultimate professional uh portfolio is one that has a lot of passive just to to minimize costs basically and that's going to um favor the large caps yeah, it's just flows after flows into the large and it's less scrutiny over which specific companies are better than others. And I think maybe in the wake of this, uh, you know, we're, we're about now one year past when the market started bouncing out of out of the 2022 bear. And, you know, what, what the technicians talk about is like narrow leadership that if you look at the equal weight S&P, you know, it's up like low single digits this year versus the roughly 20% of the S&P. So there aren't really very many stocks um, driving this. Um, though, you know, one of the things I've expected for years where I'm going with this is like maybe just maybe one of the things that starts giving small caps some outperformance it's just a greater degree of dispersion in general because heading into um, the 2022 bear market, there'd been a lot of like everything moves together, um, rising tide lifts all boats. And there hadn't really been, you know, correlations had gotten as tight as they had ever been basically for a lot of that time period. Um, and that, you know, I think is passive flow driven to a great degree. You know, some might say it was the monetary policy regime. Uh, you know, that very well might be it. But Maybe we just get like a world where there's a lot more dispersion over the next decade. And that would strongly favor active managers, though maybe I'm also just biased because I am an active manager and that's what I'm, you know, looking to find. Yeah, I would I would agree that in the sense, Elliot, that if we do get to a point where it's just obvious and stupid and completely overdone. Like, and again, I wouldn't want to put a time frame on this prediction, but I do still believe in the power of the market and the amount of capital behind intelligent active investors to find the good equilibrium level over a period of of years and years and again it could be more years it's been 15 years of outflow and you know when was the last let's say rolling 5 year period that small caps outperformed do you know off the top of your head i mean it's been a long time right yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. I could probably f- pull up this chart. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I yeah, I don't either. But let's let's assume that it's been a decade, uh, which it's probably been, or maybe even more. Um, and if that's unwarranted, I would not expect that to persist for more than another decade. But you've certainly had, you know, ten and twenty year periods where things were really rough and things didn't look like they were in balance. But yet we kind of come around eventually and get to the other end. So. That that's more or less how I would look at it. I mean, I I do think that if there are individual companies either in or out of the small cap index or the index itself that just get to stupid levels, that eventually water will find its level in that regard. 
Yeah, I think it was the period immediately preceding the GFC where the small caps really outperformed on a rolling five-year period. It had a period coming out of the GFC where where they outperformed as well, but not for nearly as long. Yeah, it was relatively quick, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And you could kind of explain the post-GFC period as like a very strong uh, run for kind of like energy, materials, soft commodities, and banks. So it's the kind of sectors that are overpopulated in small caps in the first place. And I think a lot of the small cap underperformance during this wave started with those sectors. And perhaps, you know, I, I, I've, I've kind of attributed some of this uh, phenomenon to how the growth companies have stayed private for much longer. And like the really fast growth period has happened for the benefit of VCs who are able to hang on to their ownership for an extended period of time. And so what formerly were companies who would IPO and then grow phenomenally, think about like a Netflix coming out of uh, their IPO in the wake of, of the dot-com bus. Like those kinds of companies didn't come public. Um, you know, they'd come public like Facebook was already a large cap when it came public, even though they had a really good growth period thereafter. Um, so I, I do think there's some degree to which uh, that hurt things. But then you think about the sectors that had worked, those have been out of favor. So there are some like fundamental things that you could point to that may have kicked it off. But the the extremeness and the, the degree to which it's been prolonged, I think is what makes me like, makes my eyes open wide here. And then also, you know, with what's happened in the last year, um, there are some companies who'd been large caps for some portion of time, whether it had been, you know, someone ephemeral just in the, the COVID bubble, I think it's safe to call it that now, or whether it had been they had, you know, five great years heading into that who are now small caps again. So maybe that's where you start getting some better growth coming from and kind of sow the seeds of the next wave of of good performance, uh, you know, these fallen angels. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you are sowing the seeds of future good performance if you're having a long period of lag, right? I mean, I think that that axiom holds true. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's pretty clear to me the onus is on the mega caps. Uh, if this, you know, is going to widen even more, um, there's going to have to be just more impressive uh, growth coming from the mega caps to get any kind of further multiple expansion. Um, you know, it's things like NVIDIA, uh, right? Um, they're not in those mega caps. Now they are, but they weren't before. Uh, but, you know, something like AI driving huge margin expansion at those mega caps, uh, maybe that could extend this run. Uh, but other than that, I, I, I do see the pendulum swinging back just for fundamental reasons just as as you know any investor that's making rational decisions i mean if you take let's say an investor that focuses on dividends right if you can get a twice the dividend yield uh from a small cap uh, with the same kind of um earnings payout um and you know at the same level of risk you're getting twice the dividend yield um why why wouldn't you take that you know but again some market flows are not are, are not rational but i got to believe that if we want to talk about trends that we should tilt toward uh rationality in in investment decisions speaking of rationality and a and a bet that we could actually quantify do you think we will see let's even do a shorter period of time a rolling three-year period of outperformance of the Russell 2000 over the S&P 500 first or the complete disappearance of meme stocks first? Mm. Well, what's, what's complete disappearance? Like, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear the term meme stock. I don't want to see like <laughs> social media mentions. I don't want to see AMC or GameStop or any of the rest of them raising capital. <laughs> you well, know, but AMC is finally, finally, finally going down. It's down. It, it outperformed I the know, typical SaaS I stock know. last year. It's down like right. 80%. But yeah, we're also would... speaking like, do, what about is we work a meme stock? They doubled in one day on reverse splitting, but I don't think they've got like the yeah. hodlers like AMC. So. <laughs> 
I guess it would be hard to define. Uh, you're right. Because I kind of feel like this is the year they are dying. So maybe it's the year that small cap outperformance starts. So GameStop yeah. still frustratingly resilient compared to AMC. Yeah. What's the? Let's see what the. Uh, yeah, I mean the the, the GameStop market cap is still five point six billion dollars right now. <laughs> you know, there's still just so much crazy nonsense like that going on that. I don't know. I'd have to think about how to define it, but you get the point, right? Yeah. Crazy, crazy things can go on for a long, long time, lot, much longer than I would have ever imagined. I mean, it, we, we remember when we had Spencer Jacob on the podcast to talk about this when he wrote his book? That seems like a long time ago, and here we are. It is, it was a long time ago, and now Seth Rogen's making a movie about it. Yeah, that's right. There's a whole new movie. There's already they've already made a movie about it that's coming out soon, and here we are. And it's called Dumb Money, which it is, is just a great money, name. Yeah. Although their point is the kid. opposite of what they're trying to convey, I think, from what I've heard uh, about what the movie's going to be about. <laughs> yeah, I can't figure out what the movie's going to be about either. And and the other irony is that Steve Schwartzman's kid is the producer and the backer of the whole thing. Really? Yeah. And I think they really attack short selling, but I guess that's not really Steve Schwartzman's domain. No, that, not the short selling part, but it's just like, where do you think the money for this thing came from? <laughs> like, yep. you know, that, that, that to me is the part that I just can't, like you can't make it up. If you explain this to people that like this whole thing kind of started on internet message boards because they thought they were going to stick it to the man, the man being like Wall Street and hedge funds and whatever. And all you did was enrich Wall Street with all this nonsense and create a bunch of uneconomic pain and suffering. It's just beyond me. I just you can't make it up. People are strange. strange and Roaring things. Kitty works in the worked in the finance industry, and I think he yeah. had a C, has the CFA uh, designation. I think he does. I think he was in like some risk management type role, wasn't he? Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. None of this whole thing makes sense. What an interesting time to be alive. Yeah. No kidding. But Phil, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to disappoint you, but I think that meme stocks are here to stay and, and not the ones that that we're talking about now, like AMC and, and GameStop, but I just think the the notion of meme stocks um is gonna stick around just because memes are here to stay and some memes are gonna be used uh in the future to promote specific stocks. I mean, it's kind of like I guess, legalized pump and dump schemes that can now make their way around the globe. And, you know, you you you, you take some trend like AI <laughs> and you can hit your, you can start a new, uh, you know, meme stock uh, with that. Well, that's always been true. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the shyster of the day latching onto whatever's popular and whatever's in the news. So, you know, it, it used to be right, you know, during the dot com boom we talked about earlier. All you had to do was put dot com at the end of your name, and your multiple would go up, you know, ten turns or whatever. It was ridiculous, but that, so that's always been around. I agree that will never go away. I'm talking about this like weird populist movement that has come around, where it's like fun to lose money, it's fun to gamble, it's fun to prop up uneconomic enterprises out of nostalgia or spite or some weird psychological vendetta like that whole thing to me at least is as far as i know somewhat unprecedented in financial markets and truly bizarre yeah i'm gonna quote elon musk in giving my answer he said the most entertaining outcome is the most likely and i think he did it while pumping dogecoin in particular mm -hmm. so yeah i feel like in this modern era that narratives have a way of snowballing so to john's point that memes are here to stay you know if memes are here to stay meme stocks are here to stay though i think you know amc is no longer it maybe gamestop still has a little uh air left in the balloon but there will be another one and another one and different reasons and you know i think it's part of why like with nostalgia you start seeing things like beanie babies take on value again and i i don't say have like take on value uh, very passively. <laughs> but there are things that, you know, don't really have true definable economic value, uh, including something like art that people would pay extreme sums for. And so some of that's about, I mean, in art, it's obviously about scarcity and, you know, some degree of uh, like objective beauty. But in other areas, I definitely think there's 
um, some portion of people uh, who are willing to pay for something that is separate and like it's paying, it's not investing is, is the way I'd see it. Yeah. And so actually that's kind of an interesting corollary then is if a lot of this is driven by attention and eyeballs and the viral transmission of information or disinformation or whatever it may be uh, via the internet and social media channels, then that might point to the continued outperformance, justified or not, of large caps over small caps because the large caps are going to get more attention, more mentions, uh, more social media credibility, more hits, more links, all that stuff. And people are going to follow each other like lemmings and just continue to pile into the biggest, trendiest, most popular companies, right? It's a good point. I think Apple is the most owned retail stock in Fidelity. I forgot exactly how they quantified that, but yeah. And although that kind of is, I'd say, tautological because when you're the biggest company in the world by far, you probably are the most owned, but there is some way in which they quantified that, that, that expressed it beyond just what the capitalization would imply. <laughs> Right. But yeah, I think right. you're. I think you're right. I, I like the way you phrase that, Phil. Yeah, yeah. I would still have to go with with small caps from from here on out. Um, oh yeah, I never gave my answer. I am same small caps, even though I think meme stocks are here to stay. I'm I'm all over the place, but I, you know, I think I I think GameStop and those are gonna are gonna perish, and you know, small caps are are gonna outperform. Bill, your call. Yeah, I mean, like I said, if you put a gun to my head and I could only pick one, you know, allocation to an ETF in the Russell 2000 or the S&P 500, I guess I would pick the Russell, but I wouldn't do it with a whole lot of confidence. All right. Well, on that note, uh, thanks, guys, for another fascinating discussion. And thanks, everyone, for listening. It's good to be back and uh, we'll look forward to chatting again uh, very soon. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.